Give a warm welcome to Jerry Kaplan, everyone. Thanks. How's the mic? Oh, wow. That was cool. All right, well, a mentor of mine used to say, never give a talk the first time. I want you to know, I put together a special talk for you guys. It's the first time I'm giving it. We'll see what happens. Uh, I should leave some time. I, I have lots of weird anecdotes about Google that I will be happy to tell when I'm not on the camera, <laughs> as long as I'm not being recorded. OK. So now for something completely different, as they used to say in Monty Python. Now, the common wisdom about artificial intelligence is that we're building increasingly intelligent machines that are ultimately going to surpass human capabilities and steal our jobs and maybe even escape human control and take over the world. So I'm going to present the case today that that narrative is both misguided and counterproductive, that a more appropriate way to frame this, which is really better supported by actual historical and current events, is that AI is simply a natural extension of long-standing efforts to automate tasks that date back at least to the start of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and then I want to talk about the content, the, the uh, consequences, if you think about it in that particular way. But let me ask a little bit about the audience. How many of you are engineers? OK. <laughs> How many of you are not engineers? Two. How many people haven't raised their hand yet? Nobody. OK. That was, it's called closure, right? Um, OK. And uh, how many of you were doing anything even vaguely related to AI? Oh, not that many. OK. Cool. At least you won't, you won't admit it uh, by the time I'm done with my talk, I think. Uh, OK, so let me start with a little bit of a history lesson. Because I'm teaching uh, uh, impact of artificial intelligence at Stanford. And much to my shock, the students who studied artificial intelligence don't know much about its history. So here's a kind of irreverent view. I'm going to start with an unorthodox history of AI. Now, here's a news flash for you. Science does not proceed scientifically. So it's like the making of uh, legislation and sausage. You know, perhaps this is uh, better done outside of the public view. Uh, more than you might want to believe, progress is often due to the clash of egos and ideas and institutions. Well, you guys work in an institution. I'm sure you see that occasionally. In artificial intelligence, there's no exception. So let me start right at the beginning. Dartmouth College, 1956, a group of scientists they got together for an extended working session. How many of you know who John McCarthy is? Oh, man. OK. He's a mathematician who was then employed at Dartmouth. Now, he hosted this meeting along with, raise your hand if you know these guys, Marvin Minsky. Oh, more than John. OK. Uh, he was then at Harvard. Uh, Claude Shannon. That's good. You guys should know who Shannon is. Uh, he was at Bell Laboratories. And uh, Nathaniel Rochester, probably no hands up. One hand. Are you a son? <laughs> Sorry? OK, there you go. Uh, he was at IBM. Now, here's what, he's, what these guys had to say, or John McCarthy had to say. He called this proposal a proposal for the Dartmouth Summer Research Project on Artificial Intelligence. Now, this was the first known use of the term artificial intelligence. But that's uh, What's not commonly known is why did John McCarthy choose that particular name? He explained this later, much later, actually, uh, his motivation. He said, as for myself, one of the reasons for inventing the term artificial intelligence was to escape the association with cybernetics. Its concentration on analog feedback seemed misguided, and I wished to avoid having either to accept uh, Norbert Wiener as a guru or having to argue with him. Okay, now. Norbert Wiener, as you, you may know, was a highly respected senior. Norbert Wiener? Anybody? Know? Oh, my God. OK. Well, cybernetics. Uh, cybernetics? Good. Heard the term, at least. Uh, he was a, a highly respected senior mathematician and a philosopher at MIT. Now, at the meet, at, while he was that, McCarthy, this guy, was a, a, just a junior professor at Dartmouth. So he didn't want to have to go up against you know, the powers to be. So to understand the original intention of the Founding Fathers of AI, it's worth reading some of the actual text of this conference proposal. I think it's on the screen. Uh, the study is to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning 
or any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. An attempt will be made to find out how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans, and improve themselves. It's 1950, what was it, six? Um, we think that a significant advance can be made in one or more of these problems if a carefully selected group of scientists work on it together for a summer. Now, that's a pretty dubious agenda for a summer break. Now, many of the Dartmouth conference participants had their own view uh, about how to best approach artificial intelligence. But John McCarthy's specialty was mathematical logic. Now, in particular, he believed that logical inference was the key to, as he put using his words, simulated intelligence. That's what he thought AI was. Now, his approach, skipping ahead quite a ways, but his approach eventually became known as what's called the physical symbol systems hypothesis. Anybody here have heard of that? One per good man, okay. You can take over for the rest of the talk. Now that was the dominant paradigm in the field of artificial intelligence for the first 30 years uh, or so after the Dartmouth conf conference. Now, here's John McCarthy. Uh, I'm old enough to have known John McCarthy when I was a postdoc at Stanford, where he founded the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab. Now, John was definitely a brilliant scientist. Uh, he invented the programming language LISP. Good. Uh, and he invented the concept of time sharing. Not too many people know that. Uh, but he definitely had the mad professor thing going. Let's see if this works. Almost. I'm using somebody else's computer. Uh, you know, he had the, uh, the wild eyes and the hair. The guy on the right, as you may know, is uh, uh, Professor Emmett Brown, who invented the, what is it, the, the flux capacitor time machine? How many people know the flux capacitor? Okay, good, good. I'm just checking to make sure this talk works. <laughs> uh, but I'm confident uh, that uh, John McCarthy, having met him, uh, never really expected that his clever name for the emerging field is going to turn out to be one of the great accidental marketing coups of all time. So it's not only inspired generations of researchers, including myself, but it spawned a virtual industry of science fiction and Hollywood blockbusters and media attention and uh, pontificating pundits, also including myself. Um, had he named the field something less rousing, like logical programming or symbolic systems, I doubt very many of us would have ever heard of the field today. It simply, the field just would have motored along, automating various tasks while we marveled at the, cleverless, not, at the cleverness, not of what the creations were, but of the engineers. Uh, I'm getting a little bit ahead of my story. In any case, McCarthy's hypothesis that logic was the basis of human intelligence is at best questionable. Today, in fact, most AI researchers have abandoned this approach and believe it was just plain wrong. Uh, the symbolic system approach has been almost entirely abandoned in favor of generally what's now referred to as machine learning. How many people here are doing machine learning? Good, okay, or you certainly know about it. Uh, but rejecting that old approach is throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Some truly important advances in computing came out of symbolic systems including things like heuristic search algorithms, logical problem solvers, game players, uh, reasoning systems. These were all the old approach. Um, and many of the results of all of that work are uh, in pra wide practical use today. Uh, for example, uh, formulating driving directions. I got lost coming here. Didn't know the difference between the express lane and the regular lane. I thought I was in the other one. Take this exit. No exit. Uh, laying out factories and warehouses, um, proving that complex computer chips actually meet their specifications. This all uses a early AI techniques. And I'm sure that there are many more of these to come. Now, did I mention machine learning? It's certainly the focus of most current research, uh, and in some circles, at least where I am, it's considered a serious candidate for the real basis of human intelligence. Now, my personal opinion is that while it's a very powerful technology, 
and it's going to have a very significant practical impact, it's very unlikely to be the computational equivalent of the human mind. Now, whatever your view, you might be surprised uh, to learn a little more about where the fundamental concepts that underlie what's called the connectionist or neural networking approach to machine learning came from. There are some other approaches, mainly in the statistical area. So let's see. Frank Rosenblatt, anybody heard of him? Wow, OK, great. Uh, I didn't until I started researching this. Back in the late 1950s, John McCarthy wasn't the only one interested in building intelligent machines. There was another highly optimistic proponent, and that was Professor Frank Rosenblatt at Cornell. Another competing prominent institution. You've got Cornell, you've got Dartmouth, you've got lots of people at MIT. And Rosenblatt was intrigued by some pioneering research by psychologists uh, Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts at the University of Chicago. And uh, McCulloch and Pitts had observed that a network of brain neurons could be modeled by, of all things, logical expressions. So Rosenblatt got the bright idea to implement their ideas in a computer program, which he rebranded as a perceptron. Anybody heard of perceptrons? Oh, good. Cool. Now, he built an early version of what today we, we would call a simple neural network. This is the geekiest looking guy. He looks like he's 12 years old. That's him. Does this thing have a? That's his, uh, that's his actual uh, photocell array right there. So oops. Now, now, he wasn't about to be outdone by McCarthy and Minsky. So Rosenblatt heavily promoted his work in the popular press. For instance, he was quoted in the New York Times in 1958 saying, let's see if this will work here. Yep. Uh, the machine that he's going to build would be the first device to think as the human brain. In principle, it would be possible to build brains that could reproduce themselves on an assembly line and which would be conscious of their existence. This is 1958. Uh, the article went on to say that the em embryo of an electronic computer, the embryo of an electronic computer today that will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. Now, here's, here's what I love. It is expected to be finished in about a year at a cost of about $100,000. <laughs> so much for the journalistic accuracy of the New York Times. By the way, I'm usually debating uh, John Markoff, a science writer there. We love debate each other. I wish he was here. He'd go crazy. Um, now, that might seem a little bit optimistic, given that Rosenblatt's demonstration included only 400 photocells connected to 1,000 perceptrons, which, after 50 trials, was able to tell whether a card had a square marked on the right side or on the left side. That's what he could do. Now, on a more positive note, and this is also pretty, pretty remarkable, I can't help but notice that many of his wilder prophecies in the article have actually now become reality. He went on to say, listen to this closely, remember 1958, later perceptrons will be able to recognize people, call out their names, instantly translate speech from one language to speech or writing in another language. Now, he was right, but it only took 50 years longer than, than he predicted. OK, now, Rosenblatt's work was well known to at least some of the uh, participants at that Dartmouth con conference. In particular, he attended the Bronx High School of Science. Anybody here go there? Not one. We're on close. Uh, with Marvin Minsky. They were one year apart. And so they later wound up going to these different forums and debating each other. Uh, promoting their respectively favored approaches to artificial intelligence until in 1969, Minsky, who's now at MIT, remember one guy's at Cornell, the other guy's at MIT, um, along with uh, a, a colleague of uh, Marvin Minsky's called Seymour Papert, published a book called Perceptrons, in which he went to pains to discredit, somewhat unfairly, I might add, a simplified version of Rosenblatt's work. Now, here's the way science really works. Now, Rosenblatt was unable to mount a proper defense for a very simple reason. Anybody guess what it was? 
He died in a boating accident in 1971, two years later. Couldn't defend himself. Now, the book, however, proved highly influential, effectively foreclosing funding and research on perceptrons and artificial neural networks, networks in general for more than a decade. Uh, so, after 50 years, which is better? The symbolic systems approach or the machine learning approach? Plain fact is both of these approaches have different strengths and weaknesses. In general, symbolic reasoning is more appropriate for problems that require abstract reasoning. And machine learning, on the other hand, is better for problems that require sensory perception or extracting patterns from large collections of noisy data. So you might ask the question, why was the symbolic approach dominant in the last half of the 20th century? And machine learning is dominant today. The answer is fairly simple. The machines. They're literally a million times faster, cheaper, and have a million times more memory at the same price as they did back then. That's a qual qualitative difference. Uh, in the early days of AI, machines just weren't powerful enough to automatically learn anything of interest. The square's on the right, the square's on the left. Um, they had only a minuscule fraction of the processing speed and a vanishingly small amount of memory in which to store data compared to today's computers. But most importantly, they, there simply weren't many sources of machine-readable data available to learn from. What were you going to learn? Uh, you know, for real-time learning, most communication at that time was on paper. Uh, you know, for real-time learning, the, the data from sensors was equally primitive and only available usually in analog form that really resisted processing digitally. So you had four trends, improvement in computing speed, memory, the transition from physical to electronically stored data, uh, and easier access to large bodies of data. God knows you guys know about that. It's mainly due to the internet. It, and uh, low cost, high resolution digital sensors. I don't know how I came up with five, but I can't count. Uh, these were the prime drivers. Never give a talk the first time. These were prime drivers in the refocusing of efforts from the symbolic reasoning approach to the machine learning approach. OK, there's a little bit of history for you. Now let me get to the main issue. Can machines think? Hmm. So what is artificial intelligence, really? After a lifetime of work in this field and a great deal of reflection on this question, my uh, reluctant and uh, disappointing answer is simple. No. Or at least they can't think the way people think. So far, at least, there's no obvious roadmap from here to there. Machines are not people. And there's simply no persuasive argument that they're on the same path to becoming generally intelligent, sentient beings, despite what you see in the movies. Now, wait a minute, you might say. Jerry, can't they solve all sorts of complex reasoning and perception problems? Sure they can. They can perform tasks that humans solve using intelligence. But that doesn't mean that the machines are intelligence. It merely means that many tasks that we thought required general intelligence are, in fact, so subject to solution by other kinds of mechanical means. Now, there's an old joke in AI, which is that once an AI problem is solved, it's no longer AI. Anybody heard that? A couple of people. Good. Now, personally, I don't think that's any longer a joke. I'm going to look at some of the signature accomplishments of artificial intelligence from this different perspective. Let's start with, oops, OK, computer chess. Now, for decades, most of you guys weren't around to see this, but I was. The, the archetypal test of the coming of age in AI wasn't the Turing test. It was, could a machine ever beat the world's chess champion? Uh, for a long time, you see, chess was considered the quintessential demonstration of human intelligence. So surely, when a computer was world chess champion, AI would have arrived. That's it. We'd have smart machines. Well, it happened in 1997 when IBM's Deep Blue beat the then champion Gary Kasparov. Uh, now, lots of ink was spilled in the media lamenting the arrival of super intelligent machines there's a lot of hand-wringing or what this meant for the future of mankind. But the truth is, it meant nothing. 
other than that you could do a lot of clever programming and use the increases in speed of computers to play chess. The techniques used have applications to similar classes problems, but they hardly prove to be the harbing, harbingers of the robot apocalypse. OK, so let me tell you what people said after that non-event happened. They said, OK, sure, computers can play chess, but they'll never be able to drive a car. This really was what happened. That requires a broad understanding of the real world, the ability to make split-second judgments in chaotic circumstances. And it requires common sense. Jeez, no, no, I'll never have that. Well, as you know, this bulwark of human supremacy was breached in 2004 with the uh, DARPA Grand Challenge for Autonomous Vehicles, which are soon coming, if they're not here, to a parking lot near you. How many of you guys have taken a ride in the uh, Google self-driving cars? What? Oh, they should send one up here. You, you guys haven't had a, have you been over to, at least down to the Tesla dealership to take a test drive on there? I did that over the weekend. Eh. The self-driving car was cool. <laughs> okay, now our self-driving cars do just that. They drive cars. They don't build houses, they don't cook meals, they don't make beds, that's what they do. Okay, so computers can play chess and drive cars. But then we said, people said, but they could never play Jeopardy. Okay, well, that requires too much world knowledge and understanding metaphors and clever wordplay. Well, thanks again to the ingenious people at IBM. This hurdle has also been cleared. As undoubtedly you know, IBM's Watson system beat Ken Jennings, the, uh, the world uh, cha Jeopardy champion, in 2011. Now, what is Watson? The reality is, it's a collection of facts and figures encoded into a cleverly organized modules that can quickly and accurately answer various types of common Jeopardy questions. And Watson's main advantage over the human contestants, believe it or not, was that he could ring in before they could when it estimated a high likelihood that it had a correct answer. I'd love to go into this in more detail for you. It turns out all, most of the Jeopardy champions know the answers. And they're just not that fast. And so the machine had numerous advantages. I, it's a long, and it was kind of a, a magic show. It's a wonderful accomplishment. It's, it's, it's really a remarkable and very sophisticated knowledge-based retrieval system and an inference system that was honed, at least at that time, to a particular problem set. Now they're trying to apply it to lots of others. Now, if you, how many of you saw that, or you know, pictures of it, or? OK, now, here's what bothers me. This is this supposed to be animated? Ah, OK. Now, in my opinion, IBM didn't do the field of AI any favors by wrapping Watson in a theatrical suite of anthropomorphic features. There's really no technical reason to have the system say its response in a calm, didactic tone of voice. Yes, Alex, the answer is such and such. Much less to put up a head-like graphic of swirling lights suggesting the machine had a mind and was thinking about the problem. These were incidental adornments to a tremendous technical achievement. Now, without a deep understanding of how these systems work, and with humans as the only available exemplars, with which to interpret the results, the temptation to view them as human-like is really irresistible. But they aren't those things. OK, so let me give you a couple more interesting examples, more contemporary, things that you're probably more familiar with. Uh, what about these machine learning systems? Aren't they more like human intelligence? Well, not really. I'm sure I could argue this for two hours here. Lots of people sticking their hand up. In reality, the use of the term neural networks is little more than an analogy. In the same sense, by saying like airplane design was inspired by birds. It's in the same category. Consider how machines and people learn. You can teach a computer to recognize cats by showing it a million images. You guys know Andrew Ng? OK. He was at Google when he did that work. Uh, or you show it a million images, or you can simply point one out to a three-year-old to get the same John job done. That's a cat. Oh, that's it. Now, from then on, 
a three-year-old knows what a cat is. Obviously, humans and machines do not learn the same way. Now, let me show you, give you another interesting example. Anybody here doing machine translation? One Google site. OK. I'm going into the lion's den in about two weeks. I'm going to talk to the machine translation. Now, tremendous strides have been made in this field in the past few years, mainly by applying statistical and machine learning techniques to large bodies of concorded text. But how do people perform this difficult task? Think about how people do it. They learn two or more languages, along with their respective cultures and conventions. Then they read some text in one language. They understand what it says, and they render the meaning as closely as possible in another language. Now, machine translation, as successful as it is today, bears no relationship to the human translation process. It, it, its success simply means that there's another way to approximate the same results. It, it's mostly just concordances of text. It doesn't relate to the way people solve that problem. What do we learn from this? It's just a way to, we just didn't think there was another solution, but there is, besides having people understand that. Now, let me go on to one that you're all carrying around. You carry around smartphones. They're reminiscent of the capabilities of the computer on the Star Trek Enterprise. Star Trek? Everybody? Okay. Good. OK. Just, I, I, do, I started talking about the Jetsons in my class. Stanford, nobody knew what I was talking about. What's that? You know, Rosie and, uh, you know, OK. That's called getting old. Uh, so you know, this is more like uh, lost complete track. And I got the whole thing right in front of me. Anyway, hey, Siri, you know, you can, you can talk to your phone, and it talks back. It also becomes more capable every day as you download new apps and upgrade the operating system. Sorry, I'm using an example from a different company. Uh, but do you really think of your phone as getting smarter in the human sense when you download an app or you enable voice recognition? Certainly not in the same sense that you get smarter when you learn calculus or when you learn philosophy. It's the electronic equivalent of a Swiss Army knife. It's a bunch of different information processing tools that are bound together into a single unit taking advantage of some commonalities, like detailed maps and like internet access. Now, you have one integrated mind, while your phone has no mind at all. There's no one home. So, I've tried to make the case that machines perform an increasingly diverse array of tasks that people perform by applying their native intelligence. Now, does that mean that machines are smart? Well, now that things get interesting, let's talk about how you might measure supposed machine intelligence. OK, I pulled that picture off the internet. So I, to, I didn't make it up. But that's part of the point I'm trying, going to try to make. We can start by looking at how we measure human intelligence. Now, a common method is with IQ tests. But even for humans, this is a deeply flawed concept. We love to measure and rank things with numbers. But let's face it, reducing human intelligence to a flat linear scale is highly questionable. Now, little Sally did two more arithmetic problems than Johnny did in the time allotted, so her IQ is seven points higher than his. Bull. But this is not to say that some people aren't smarter than others, only that simple numerical measures provide an inappropriate patina of objectivity and precision. You know, as psychologists are uh, fond of pointing out, there are many different kinds of intelligence. It's social and emotional, analytic, athletic, musical, et cetera. But what on earth does it mean to say that Mozart and Einstein have the same IQ? Now, suppose we gave the same intelligence test to a machine. Wow, it only took one millisecond to accurately complete all of the sums that took Sally and Johnny an hour. It must be super smart. It also outperforms all humans on memory tests, logical reasoning tests, God knows what else. Maybe it can shoot straighter, read faster, can outrun the fastest human. Oh my God, robots can outperform us. What are we all going to do? So are the robots taking over? Up. Are the robots taking over? 
know, of course, by the logic I just gave you, machines took over a long time ago, whether they're smart or not. They move our freight, they score our tests, they explore the cosmos, they plant and pick most of our crops, they trade stocks, they store and retrieve our documents, as Jacob knows, <laughs> and petabytes. Uh, they manufacture just about everything, including themselves. And sometimes they do with human help, and sometimes without human intervention. And yet, they aren't taking over our businesses. They aren't marrying our children. They're not watching the sci-fi channel when we're not around. So what's wrong with the traditional picture of AI? We can build machines and write programs that perform tasks that previously required human intelligence and attention. But there's really nothing new about that. Each new technological breakthrough, from the invention of the plow to CGI rendering of Rapunzel's hair, is better understood as an advance in automation, not as a usurpation of human primacy. Now, we can program machines to solve very complex problems. And we, they may operate with increasing independence. But as a friend of mine once observed, a vehicle will really be autonomous when you instruct it to take you to the office and it decides to go to the beach instead. My point is simple. Lots of problems we think require human intelligence to solve actually don't. There are lots of other ways to solve them, and that's what the machines are doing. Calculating used to be the province of highly trained specialists. Do you guys know that? You used to go see somebody when you wanted to do some calculation. Uh, now all it takes is the 99 cent calculator. You know, making money in the stock market used to be the province of experts. Now the majority of trading is initiated by computers. It's the same for driving directions, picking and packing orders in warehouses, designing more efficient wings for airplanes. But you don't have to worry about the robots taking over. Robots don't have feelings, except in the movies. Here's a news flash for you. They aren't male or female. Uh, so I like to say to my, my Stanford students, what does it mean for a robot to be gay? Okay, so robots don't have independent goals and desires. A robot that's designed to wash and fold laundry isn't going to wake up one day and say, oh my god, what a fool I've been. I really want to play the great concert halls of Europe. So just as we can teach bears to ride bikes, and we can teach chimps to use sign language. We could build machines that perform tasks the way people do, and even to simulate human emotions. We can make them say, ouch, when you pinch them, or wag their tails when you pet them. But there's simply no compelling reason to believe this bears any meaningful relationship to human behavior or experience. Machines aren't people, even if we build them to talk and walk and chew gum the way that we do. OK, now I've given you a new uh, way to think about artificial intelligence. Let's talk about the implications of this new perspective. I'm going to try to run through this pretty quickly because I was warned people like to ask questions. Now, it's certainly true that AI is going to have a serious impact on labor markets and employment, but perhaps not in the way that people expect. If you think of machines as coming, becoming even more intelligent uh, and threatening our livelihoods, uh, the obvious solution is to prevent them from getting smarter and to lock our doors and arm ourselves with tasers against these robots that are coming to take our jobs. Well, the robots are coming, but not exactly for our jobs. Machines and computers don't perform jobs. They automate tasks. Now, except in extreme cases, you don't roll in a robot and show an employee to the door. Instead, the new technologies hollow out and change the jobs that people perform. Even experts spend most of their time doing mundane, repetitive tasks. They review lab tests. They draft simple contracts. They write straightforward press releases. They fill out paperwork and forms. On the blue collar side, lots of workers lay bricks, paint houses, mow lawns, drive cars, load trucks, pack boxes, and take blood samples. They fight fires, deliver mail, direct traffic, et cetera. And many of these intellectual and physical tasks require straightforward logic or simple hand-eye uh, coordination. Uh, now, the new technologies, mainly driven by artificial intelligence, are poised to automate these tasks, 
not to replace the jobs. Now, if your job involves a narrow, well-defined set of duties, and many do, then indeed your employment is at risk. If you have a broader set of responsibilities, or if your job requires a human touch, such as expressing sympathy or providing companionship, uh, I don't think you have too much to worry about. Now, just check out this comparison of the job duties between licensed practical nurses and bricklayers. Whose job do you think is most at risk from automation? By the way, this list is hilarious. If, I'm sorry, pull one of these here. Monitoring fluid and food intake and output. It's like, OK. I didn't know they measure output. Uh, providing emotional support. Which of you guys are working on it? I am so sorry about your problem. I mean, come on. Uh, most jobs, as opposed to tasks, involve a mix of general capabilities and specific skills. And as machines perform the more routine tasks, the plain fact is that fewer people are needed to get the jobs done. So one person's productivity enhancing tool is in fact another's pink slip, or more likely, a job opening that no longer needs to be filled. Now, this is called structural unemployment. Automation, whether it's driven by artificial intelligence or not, it changes the skills that are necessary to perform work. Uh, let me move ahead because we're running out of time. Uh, so this is called structural un un unemployment, and it's the mismatch of skills against the needs of employers. People get put out of work because uh, it's not so much that there's a lack of jobs, but the, the training that people need to perform those jobs there's a disconnect. Now, historically, as automation has eliminated the need for jobs, need for workers, excuse me, uh, the resulting increase in wealth has eventually generated new kinds of jobs to take up the slack. And I see no reason that pattern is not going to continue. But the key word there is eventually. Let's talk about farm employment. This stuff is amazing if you look into it. 200 years ago, more than 90% of the US population worked in agriculture. Basically, almost all anyone did was grow and prepare food, prepare food. That's what it meant to work. Now, today, less than 2% of the population is required to feed everybody. You can see in the free food over here. Uh, oh my god, is everybody out of work? Of course not. We've had plenty of time to adapt. And as our standard of living has relentlessly increased, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, new opportunities have always arisen for people to fill the expanding expectations of our ever richer and greedier society. Uh, now, if a person from 1800 could see us today, they'd think we'd all gone nuts. Why not work a few hours a week, buy a sack of potatoes and a jug of wine, build a shack in the woods, dig a hole for an outhouse, and live a life of leisure? Somehow, our rising expectations seem to be magically out of pace uh, with, due to our wealth. OK, so what are the jobs of the future? I don't see why we can't be a society of competitive gamers, artisans, personal shoppers, flower rangers, tennis pros, party planners, and no doubt a lot of other things that don't exist yet. Now, you might say, well, who's going to do the real work? Well, our great-grandchildren may think of our ideal of real work is so 21st century. It may take, as we think of with uh, with agriculture, it may only take 2% of the population, assisted by some pretty remarkable automation, to accomplish what's taking 90% of our labor today. So what? You know, it may be as important to them to have fresh flowers in the house each day as it is for us to take a shower every day, which 70% of the US population does. By the way, in, in 1900, the average was once a week. OK, I'm glad I'm not there. Uh, OK, so let me move ahead. Here's, that's the good news. The bad news is that it's going to take time for this transition to happen. And there's a new wave of AI-enabled applications that's likely to accelerate the normal cycle of job creation and destruction. So we're going to need to find new ways to retrain displaced workers. Uh, I was going to go into this. I know Jacob's interested in this, but hopefully we have to skip over this idea. We need to better, our problem is our vocational training system is really messed up. It's mainly because the government today is the lender of first resort for students. So the skills that people learn 
are disconnected from the needs of the uh, employers in the marketplace. So we're not actually investing in education so much as we're handing out money to people to learn things that won't help them pay it back. Can't get a job, it's too bad. Your student loans still do. How many of you guys have student loans? Okay, not bad. Um, so there are different ways to do this, and we need to create new financial instruments that tie the development of capital, the deployment of capital, to the return on the investment. And I've got this concept that I talk about in my book, uh, which is somewhere around here, uh, that I call a job mortgage. So you're, you're, uh, you get a mortgage for your education, and it is payable solely out of your future earnings stream. And that causes all the right incentives to align so that we're teaching people the right things. Because otherwise, people aren't going to give them the money if they don't know that uh, there's going to be a likelihood of a payback. OK, finally, there's one other dark cloud. I painted a very optimistic view of the future. Uh, while it's true that automation makes society richer, there are serious questions about whose pockets are filled by that wealth. You may be aware, uh, well, we, we're all in high tech. We tend to believe we're developing dazzling technologies for a needy and grateful world. Uh, and in, indeed, we've made great progress in raising the standard of living for the poorest people on Earth. But for the developed world, the news is not so good. Up until about 1970, on and off, we found ways to distribute at least some of those economic benefits across society. And this was the rise in the supposed myth, the mythical middle class. But it doesn't take much to see that those days are over, it began to diverge. So as economists know, automation is the substitute of capital for labor. And Karl Marx was right. The struggle between capital and labor is a losing proposition for workers. What that means is that the benefits of automation naturally accrue to those who can invest in the new systems. So then why not? People aren't really working harder than they used to work. In fact, they're, they're, uh, they aren't really smarter than they used to be. Uh, working hours have actually decreased slowly but consistently for about the last 100 years. And the reason we can do more with less is that the business owners invest some of their capital into the process and productivity improvements. And they reap the, the most of the rewards. So what has all this got to do with AI? Now, the technologies that are on the drawing boards in our labs are quickening the hearts of entrepreneurs and investors everywhere, as you guys are well aware. And they are the ones who stand to benefit while they export more and more of the risk out to the rest of society. Uh, workers are less secure today. Wages are stagnant. Pension funds, funds can go bust. You know, we're raising a, a generation of contractors for the gig economy. Uh, you know, and they're working variable hours and health benefits are their own problem. Now, that's not true for you guys. You have regular employment jobs. But if you really find out what's going on in the rest of the world, this is true. Now, some people have a mistaken impression that the free market will naturally address these problems, if only we can get the government out of the way. But I'm here to tell you that our economy is hardly an example of unfettered capitalism. The fact is that there are all sorts of rules and policies that drive where the capital goes, how it's deployed, and who gets the returns. And the basic problem is, ah, it's great. I should show the slides while I give the talk. Okay. The basic problem is that our economic and regulatory policies have become decoupled from our social goals. And we have to fix that, but the question is how? Now, here's the good news. Most people have no idea about this. The good news is that the economy isn't static. It doubles about every 40 years. You guys are familiar with the singularity and the Moore's curve and all that. That's happening with the economy, too, not just with computers. It doubles about every 40 years. And it's done that reliably since the start of the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s. In 1800, the average household income was $1,000. And that's about the same as it is today in Malawi and Mozambique. Now, probably not coincidentally, their economies look surprisingly similar to what the US was 200 years ago. Now, yet. I doubt that people in Ben Franklin's time thought of themselves as dirt poor, that they were barely scratching out an existence. So what this means is that 40 years from now, most likely there's literally going to be twice as much wealth to go around. So the challenge for us 
is to implement policies that will encourage that wealth to be more broadly distributed. We don't have to take from the rich and give to the poor. We need to provide incentives for entrepreneurs and businesses to find ways to benefit ever larger swaths of society. So uh, in my book, again, I, I just give you an example of the kinds of policies that smart folks like you could come up with. And the idea here is to make corporate taxes progressive. I'm not saying this is the answer or even an answer. It's just the kind of thinking we need to do. Um, you can make pro corporate taxes progressive based on how widely distributed the equity in a company is. So companies that have larger stockholder bases uh, have a lower tax rate. Uh, Microsoft, to use them as an example, they should pay a far lower tax rate than Bechtel, which is privately held. Uh, now, progressive policies like this can promote our social goods. By the way, I fleshed that out in the book in quite a bit of detail, how it would work. And uh, I encourage you to buy a copy, if not read one. <laughs> Uh, progressive policies like that can promote our social goals without stifling the economy. We just have to get on with it, stop believing the myth that unfettered capitalism is the answer to the world's pro problems. So let me wrap things up. Let me recap. I don't want you to think I'm anti-AI. Nothing's further from the truth. I think the potential impact on the world is uh, similar, and I'm not exaggerating this. Potential impact is about the same as the invention of the wheel. We need to think of it not as some sort of magical discontinuity in the development of intelligent life on Earth, but as a powerful collection of automation tools with the potential to transform our livelihoods and to vastly increase our wealth. The challenge we face is that our existing institutions, without some enlightened rethinking, run a serious risk of making a mess of this opportunity. I'm supremely confident that our future is very bright, that it's more Star Trek than Terminator. But the transition is going to be protected and group brutal unless we pay attention to the issues that I've tried to raise with you here today. We have to find new and better ways to ensure that our economy doesn't motor on, going faster and faster, while throwing ever more people overboard. You know, our technology and our economy should serve us, not the other way around.